Warning, the following audio transmission is based on theory and is intended for entertainment purposes only. It's Doomsday and its affiliates will not be held liable for anything your dumbass does. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome everybody to It's Doomsday Podcast. Today is Sunday, November 20th, 2022. Time is 6.16 p.m. And joining me as always is Big Daddy Prep. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm, I'm wonderful, uh, Jester. A little cold. We finally got the cold here in Arkansas. It's finally winter time. But uh, other than that, other than the arthritis and the cold, I'm good. <laughs> no, I hear you, man. We're starting, to get, we're starting to get cold here, too. We had a water pump freezing break on us so far. Um... But this will be this will be like a cold snap. It'll go away here in, in a couple of weeks. It'll be gone. And it'll start warming back up here. Our winters are very very goofy here. Um, yeah. Ours are too. Before we get into tonight's episode, I got a special message for the listeners out there. So I just found out Jason David Frank, my childhood hero, played the Green and White Power Ranger on the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers TV show. Uh, died today, forty nine years old, from suicide. Details have not been released yet as far as what goes, what has all transpired. But I do want to say this, guys. We just covered suicide prevention on the show a couple weeks back. All right. We just covered this in the live show. Um, Guys, if you know anybody that's struggling with suicide, call the suicide prevention hotline 1 800 273 TALK. That's 1 800 273 TALK. And you could even text these guys now. You could text them at 988 and you could text the suicide hotline number. If you don't want to put your voice out there, if you don't want to deal with actually talking to somebody on the phone. So the help is available, guys. Now, to get into tonight's episode, Al selected this topic. Long distance travel on foot during a grid down situation. So long term foot travel. Al, what made you think of this one? Well, Jester, you know, we're not always going to have the luxury of having a vehicle or a transportation mode that's not your feet. I always say, you know, your feet, the original transportation, uh, the the original mass transportation. So you may have to travel, and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be grid down the end of the world or nuclear war. It could be anything. I mean, the power could go out, and you might have to leave where you're going to. You could break down alongside the road and have to travel a long distance. It could be anything. And If you don't have a vehicle to get there, your feet's the only way you're going to get there. How are you going to make that trip the easiest and the most effective for you? So that's, I've had to make a lot of long journeys on my feet before, whether it be in secluded locations, public locations, urban locations, and it's never fun if you're not prepared ahead of time. So that's the reason why I picked this week's topic. Absolutely. Um, I've had to travel the good old shoe leather express some long distances myself in the past. Uh, I it's think not that, fun. No, it's not. Well, it's <laughs> not fun. Um, but I think we should start with footwear. Yes. In this sense, guys, I know everybody has, you know, you think doomsday, you think tactical boots, steel toes, like all these, all these different, you know, variations of footwear. And I'm, I'm going to tell you what, I mean, my go-to for anything in the wilderness, for anything, you know, if I'm doing long distance walking, if I think it's going to rain, if it's a prepper related thing, waterproof, 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 always yep. waterproof. Waterproof 100%. for your feet, 100%, and and comfortable waterproof. You know, a lot of people get, they say, well, waterproof, you mean rubber boots? No, no, hold on a minute, I didn't say rubber boots. There's all kinds of different kind of waterproofings that you can get. Um, one of the one of the worst situations I ever had in my life, I having to be on my feet for a long period of time, was in a pair of old, cheap rubber boots working in a, in a factory. And by the end of the day, my feet were shot. So... When you're going to be on your feet for a long period of time and for a long distance, go for comfort. Go for what's going to keep you dry, comfortable, and not too tight, not too loose, not a lot of uh, 
skin on material. I think you get pretty much what I'm talking about. I hope the listeners can too. You're not rubbing a lot on your feet because the skin on your feet can very easily be rubbed off, whether it be on your ankles, the backs of your feet. That's some of the worst pain I ever had in my life is rubbing the skin off my feet. Well, yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So, guys, um, first, I want to say one thing for footwear before we get into the, the blisters and the potential injuries, guys. I know everybody thinks that side zip boots are so cool. And you got to have them because they look cool. They're tactical, you know, high fast, high speed, you know, all this, all this bullshit. I'm going to tell you guys what those zippers tend to fail. The zippers are not waterproof. Nope. Avoid getting side zip boots for an apocalyptic doomsday scenario. Okay. Avoid the side zips. Now, how Al brought that up, you don't realize you're in pain until you rub that skin rod. There's been plenty of times I've been at work and I'm like, man, my ankles are hurting all of a sudden. And I pulled my boots off and they're raw. Yep. All right. Completely raw. Having the proper fitting footwear is key. Right. Yep. And the one thing I want to tell you guys is proper fo- it, It's different when you're walking down the sidewalk or you're walking down the side of the road. And then it's, it's a whole different scenario when you're out in the wilderness and you're, and you're on terrain that's on level. Your ankles will get tore up. You'll get blisters on your toes because you're you're focusing your weight on different areas on your feet and ankles, right? Right. So nice, tight-fitting, soft, thick socks, that's what you want. Also, Jester, not just is the skin coming off your feet uncomfortable and it's it's painful it can also cause an infection very quickly and the last thing we need to do is cause any more grief to what we're doing if you had to make a long walk and you wear the skin off your feet or you have an open sore because of that now infection can take over there's nothing more that that can cause an infection more than wet nasty socks and wet nasty boots with an open sore so yeah that's bad and especially if you have any kind of a, a sickness or an illness like diabetes diabetics don't do well with infection people with bad heart conditions they don't do good with circulation so these are problems that that one initial thing can compound into several other things down the road Absolutely. And you guys got to think, you know, it's it's doomsday. You're traveling. You're not going to be able to go out and wash your toes or wash your feet. So the infection thing is real. That's a big thing to think about. And not only that, but having a few first aid products to help with you, having having the blister skin packs. You know, what I'm talking about out like that second yep. skin stuff that goes over. Having yep. those would be great. Band-Aids would be great. Neospore and triple antibiotic ointments, things like that to help prevent that infection and to speed up the healing process is going to be key. So if you were packing something to have with you in your vehicle or whatever, and you were going to make a long distance journey, maybe the pair of shoes that you initially have on aren't good for everything. So you need a pair of shoes that you can say, these are comfortable, these are good for long distance, but this isn't what I would want to do my regular job in every day. So as you've got that opening in that shoe where your foot goes, you can always jam that thing full of the mole skin, a little triple antibiotic. You can jam it in there with an extra pair of socks to keep everything inside the shoes. Now put that in the back of your, your vehicle inside of a couple of tied up bags or whatever you need to do to keep everything out of that. You've got that in case you break down on the vehicle and you go, oh, my God, well, you know, I got my work shoes on. I didn't want to walk 10 miles in these. So you change your shoes, shove that stuff in your pockets. And as you're going along, if something starts to hurt, treat it right now and progress on. So, yeah, that's that's what I do. I shove stuff in those extra pair of shoes. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, you know, and you just got me thinking, like, I don't typically have my tack boots in my truck, but they've been in there for a few weeks. I might just leave them in there indefinitely. Yep. Yeah, it, it works. I mean, I, I own a case. pair of muck boots that I love, steel toe muck boots, because I love steel toe boots. I, I, my feet have been saved se- several times by steel toe boots. I love steel toe muck boots for working around the you know farm or the wet time of the year here in Arkansas. But now, I would not want to walk 15 miles in these, okay? It's different when you're working in mud and you're working right around the house. But to take off hiking in them, no, it's not a good idea. They're too thick. They're too heavy. They, you know, there's just, it, you could actually sweat more inside those boots than you do anything. So choose the footwear very carefully and make sure it's something that you really want. Because if you don't, you're liable to pick something that's not what you want. You think it's what you want, but you've not actually tried it in a, in a, in a long walk. So I recommend taking whatever you're going to have and go hiking at five miles. See if it works for you or not. You know, break it in a little bit, then you know if that's really what you want. 
Hey preppers, do you want 10% off survival food? Go to www.readywise.com and use code DOOM10 at checkout for 10% off all your survival food needs. Again, that's code DOOM10 at checkout at readywise.com, D-O-O-M-10 for 10% off at readywise.com. Absolutely, 100%. And that's that's one, one of these things where we talk about, like, guys, test your gear, test the stuff you have. Um, definitely. All right, so footwear pretty much covered, guys. That's, you know, Shoe Leather Express. That's your main mode of transportation in this conversation we're having tonight. So that's where you want to have your primary focus at right off the bat, okay, yep. is footwear. Get that one figured out first. And then, uh, Al, which did you want to move on to next in this conversation? I like headgear. Along with sunglasses or glasses, whatever protects your eyes. Because, folks, you can absolutely cause yourself more trouble with the sun being in your eye and constantly having your hands up over your eyes. I got to see. I can't block in the sun. So get yourself a good hat, whatever, whatever's comfortable to you, something to keep the, the elements off your head, whether it be the sun, the snow, the rain, whatever, and also a good pair of sunglasses or protective glasses. In case you have to go through an area where there could be branches and limbs, I don't know if you've ever ran a branch into your eye before, but it's not fun. And I don't know if you've ever gone along on a sunny day and had to constantly have your hand over your eyes so you could see to keep the sun out. So eliminate that right now. Along with those boots, throw you a good hat in there, a couple bandanas, and a pair of sunglasses. Cheap sunglasses, expensive, if they're just regular safety glass. Whatever you want that you like, that's what you need to have. But save that especially for a long travel like that. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, and Al, just on that note, I had a friend when we were young, uh, he ran into a tree limb, and he had to get the tree resin surgically removed from his eyeball. Yep, it happens. And it, yeah, it wasn't a good time. It screwed him up pretty bad. But no, I mean, guys, good a good hat, all right, you know, to keep the water off your face. If it's raining, keep the sun out of your eyes. And the glasses, absolutely, Al, 100%. I couldn't agree more with that. And then I'm thinking, you know, you're traveling – long distance yep. right in this conversation so yes sir. now imagine this you're going to have other things on you that are going to be weighing you down probably you might have a pocket knife you might have a gun you might have extra ammunition you might have a backpack i think this conversation we need to steer steer it in one of two directions either are we bugging out and we're taking stuff with us or are we just stranded and are we just like leaving our vehicle either way you go in that situation gesture i i prefer to have a backpack i say backpack i'm not talking about the seven day you know hiking through the grand teton mountain pack i'm talking about just a regular backpack that you can throw items in i pack items ahead of time for situations like this but a good backpack that's not overly heavy but not a tiny, tiny lunchbox backpack either. Something that you can carry items in that you can wear high and tie it up on you and keep it on you, but it's not so big that it actually weighs you down because you're trying to make a long distance travel. So the more you're weighted down, the longer it's going to take you to make that travel. So I, I backpack, but you're going to have to pick the kind, you know, everybody's size is different. Everybody's build is different. Everybody's way of carrying things is different. So a backpack that fits you and your needs. Okay, I get what you're saying 100%. So I'm thinking, I'm kind of thinking in my head, you know, if it was, if it was me and I just had a regular, I mean, I don't want to be identified. I don't want it to look like I got my shit together too much, right? Right. So I'm going to have a plain Jane backpack in the vehicle that I'm walking away with. Or if I know i got to go a good distance, I'm going to take the bare necessities with me. Right. I think the one thing we have to throw in here with this is water. Um, we, all, we all know the importance of water. We know how important it is and that you're going to need it. We that's also exactly know how- what I was thinking today. I, I didn't know how to put it the way you're putting it. But, yeah, <laughs> I'd say I was thinking the same thing. So here's the reality, guys. Um, you're going to need water for survival water's heavy you're not going to be able to carry the supply that you need over a long distance all right i highly recommend this is what i highly recommend everybody does okay be capable of carrying at least a gallon with you at least a gallon all right preferably maybe like two half gallon jugs somewhere in that neighborhood right so you can regulate your water intake i drink a half gallon now i'll have a half gallon for later a gallon of water is going to get you through an all-day hike 
okay? I agree. I grant you. You're you're very. See, we tell people a lot of times that you can't carry enough water to sustain you. We we preach that to people because we don't want them trying to carry 800 gallons of water. But also, as you're making a journey that you don't necessarily know what you're going to make ahead of time, you can't possibly say, "Well, every time I get thirsty, I'm going to stop and purify me some water." No, you're probably not. So having a, a, a a, a gallon of water is a good roundabout number. That also gives you a container to put water into to carry and to be able to clean and keep clean water with you. But a lot of people say, well, I've got my, my live straw or I've got my Sawyer Mini. Or I got, that's fine. That's great. That, that helps you as you're making it on the trail and it can help you to, to clean water. But so many times we tell people, well, you can't carry enough water to sustain your life. But you do need to carry some water with you and have some with you at all times. A lot of people tell me, well, I've got my Sawyer Mini. Okay, that's great. But if you're not around water right now and you're thirsty, you're going to be in trouble. So, yes, you need to have the ability to carry something with you. I agree with you 100%. So, yeah, like, so my, my whole thought process on this is, okay, say you've got the Sawyer Mini. You're going to utilize that for filtration. All right. The nice thing about the Sawyer Mini is you could filter water, put it in a vessel, and take it with you. Right. I mean, unless you're in like a desert scenario, I couldn't think I could, I could easily hike, hike an hour in any direction from my house, and I'm going to find a water source. Me too. Right. Me too. So the the idea of having to leave my vehicle with a ton of water is just seems like a, a waste for me. Like right. I I wouldn't do that. I don't want the extra weight. So guys, water filtration is everything. And honestly, for as cheap as the Sawyer Minis are, for as cheap as water filtration is. You could afford to have a filter in every bag. You could afford to have one in every vehicle. Like, they, that's a very inexpensive prep, right? I think nowadays it's – shit, I, I would – I don't know. Al, I would say that a, a Sawyer Mini is probably the equivalent to a box of ammo nowadays. Yep, very cheap. And, and going along with the backpack that we talked about earlier – I'm one that likes a camelback to a certain extent, maybe not the military style, but a, a camelback, which is a water vessel that's, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It's a, it's a collapsible water vessel that you wear generally in a backpack or in a pack type setting, uh, kind of conforms to your body. It's very thin and it's not taking up a whole lot of weight or room if it's not full. I like camelbacks. Um, I don't know if you have any, but I, I highly recommend them to people. If they don't understand what they are, you can very easily Google them. But the military, that's what I have military grade ones, and, and I love them. But they make a lot of just regular civilian over-the-counter types. But um, as as opposed to carrying a bottle with me, I like a camelback. Right. No. So I have two actually. Al, I have one that goes in my. I have like a camo hunting bag that I take out of the woods with me when I go hunting. That I have one in that bag, and then I have another one that's in um, a bag that I take when I take out the ATVs and stuff. I have this little uh, camelback backpack that pretty much just is there. You know, miniature first aid kit. Uh, I've got uh, some tools in there, some zip ties, some duct tape, mm -hmm. basically stuff. If I'm taking the ATVs out, little things that I may need, I keep in there. Um, and, and I'm telling you guys, having a camelback is absolutely awesome. If you can get a bag that has this built in, it's going to be a lot nicer for you to carry because it kind of, it kind of keeps that water weight centered in that pack. So right. it's, it's not like having a bottle where it's sitting at the bottom of your pack and you feel it pulling down on your shoulders. It's, you know, it's just right there in the center weight distribution, really nice. And just, it's the way to go. And they're yeah. hard to put a hole in compared to a jug or a bottle or whatever that generally are a lot easier to put a hole in. Um, the next thing I think is very important to make it a long journey and a walk, and some people disagree with me on this, but the older I get, the more I think it's <laughs> hugely important, and that's a, a stick, a walking stick of some sorts. I saw people for years walk with walking sticks on when they were hiking, and, and they'd be walking through the neighborhoods or whatever, and it was to keep the, the, the little neighbor dog away, or somebody run up on them, they could use as a weapon. It is, to me, it's paramountly important that I have a stick with me, not only just for that, as 
for defense, but also in case you twist an ankle, in case something happens to you. It serves a many purposes. So for protection, to take weight off of a foot if you twist an ankle, possibly you use it to jab at something to see if something's moving that you might not know what it is. There's a, I like a walking stick. That's me. Um, some people like two walking sticks, like uh, the type that for long treks. Uh, what, what am I trying to say? They're, they're hiking sticks, sort of like uh, for skiing. You, you know what I'm talking about. Those, those. Yeah, it's like I that aluminum. Yeah, they're like the yeah. aluminum pole ones. I know exactly right. what you're talking about. Yeah. When I got older, I started understanding why people like walking sticks. And uh, now I wouldn't think about going on a long journey without one. So. Maybe not everybody would see it the way I see it, but I would definitely want to have one of those or fashion something into one of those. So that that's me for a long journey. No, I get you 100%. So something I got to factor in with this too, since you're bringing up the walking stick, guys, for those of you that haven't walked a lot, you're going to start getting aches and pains and you're going to start to be hurting. Having right. some Tylenol or some ibuprofen in your bag that's going to help keep that swelling down and help keep that arthritis pain down, I'm thinking that's uh, that's what you guys are going to want to throw in those bags there. Because walking does come with pain, right? especially if you don't do it a lot, especially if you've had any... Here's the other thing, too. I mean, think about this. If you've had past injuries, okay... This is something you need to think about because when you're out there and you're walking these long distances, you know, grid down situation, maybe you got to walk 20, 30 miles, you're going to notice these old injuries starting to flare up again. Okay. And if you know what those injuries are, you better have a way to comp for them. So uh, a good, good way to put this is my dad has suffered injuries, uh, uh, knee injuries. So he knows if he's going out to do something excruciating, he grabs the old school ace bandage and he wraps that knee up. Right. before we go out that's that's what he does and that's kind of what i'm saying guys is if you know you have that past injury and you know it could be a problem definitely have that ace bandage in there definitely have what you need in case you got to make that trip you're good right a couple ace bandages I, I, if you have a back problem and you know you've had a back problem in the past a long journey on your feet is going to bring that out so if you have a back support that you normally use if you do any heavy lifting or whatever like that you might want to throw that in the bag too because i assure you anything that you do that's a long distance walk is going to exacerbate anything with the ankles the knees the hips the back the shoulders anything that's up and down the frame of the body is going to be exacerbated by that long walk so if you know you already have it pack a couple extra ace bandages pack that bag you know that that back support so that's me I, i'm getting older jester i'm older than you by several years and i'm telling you right now you start feeling these things when you're on your feet for a long period of time Oh, absolutely. I'm sure. And I mean, like I've suffered back injuries over the years. It really doesn't affect my walking unless like I'm, I'm in pain and I can't say walking's ever caused it. But I mean, you know, one of my preps is I have the walking stick in the truck. I have a back brace in the truck just in case something starts getting aggravated. I've got a way to help myself out a little bit. Right. Right. It's it. it bandanas are important too i i like a bandana for several things i like multiple use items i like a bandana because one you can use it as a face covering two if it's a face covering to keep the sun off your face maybe it's the wind off your face maybe it's to breathe through possibly the bandana on the end of your walk signal someone or cause movement that someone sees you there's a thousand things you can use a bandana for i like bandanas to be able to to filter water with through or whatever it might be so bandanas are important to me too I like the brighter colors. Some people don't because well, I don't want anybody to see me, but maybe I want them to see me occasionally. So a bright orange bandana or a bright red bandana. Uh, I might get some others that are brown or green or whatever to mix in to, you know, where I don't stand out. But everything that we get that we're going to make a long journey with, we kind of we don't want to be flashy. We don't want a lot of things shiny or look high dollar or stuff like that. You can keep those things in the pack, but in case you do need to get someone's attention, you want to be able to do that. So I, it could be orange streamer. I like orange streamer. The, you had a roll of it. I think it was a 200 yards in it for like three or four bucks. I like that in case I'm making a trail and I need to maybe backtrack or maybe I want to leave a mark so somebody knows that I've come that direction. Um, that's very cheap. It's very lightweight. It's very inexpensive. So those are a couple of things I like to have in case I want to be found. 
Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and also the idea of just preventing yourself from getting lost too, marking the way that you're going. So you don't retrace your same steps. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, uh, so go ahead. I was going to say the other thing I kind of wanted to throw in the mix with this is, I mean, we covered the footwear, we've covered the hats, we've covered the injuries. Let's cover extreme weather changes because winter's coming guys. Absolutely. So that's Absolutely. something we definitely need to tackle as well. And I mean, guys, let's face it. When you walk, you heat up, layers come off, you stop, you're going to cold it. You're going to cool down again. All right. I see a lot of people make the mistake and I've made this mistake too, hunting over the years where I'm all bundled up. I go out there and I'm like, Oh, I'm nice and toasty. Right. Yep. And I'm walking through the woods or snow on the ground. It's, and now I start getting hot. So what do you do? You start removing layers, but you don't realize you're hot right away. So what happens? You start sweating. Absolutely. Right? Yep. Then next thing you know, what happens out? Those clothes start getting wet and they get very, very, very cold. Very cold because you've actually put a light layer of moisture on you and that light layer of moisture is going to get cold very quickly and it can actually turn to ice. You can actually get ice on your skin and your body just for your perspiration. It happens. It happens to people every year. Um, yes, you don't want to get overheated. Uh, this last week it got colder here in Arkansas. So what did I do? I immediately got out my cold weather gear. I got out my bibs and my big heavy jacket. You know, it's double insulated put it on the other day and the first thing i started to do about 20 minutes into what i was doing i started to feel like i might start sweating i'm like mm, gotta take a layer off i'm gonna use my own good judgment take the layer off um so yeah you don't want to get to sweating underneath that but there is one thing that i want to make sure that i get in there and the reason why is because like i said i am a little older than you jester and and, and i'm talking to the people that are my age or older Understand when you're making these long journeys, one thing that hurts, kills, and injures people more than anything that are having to do these things is people don't realize that one, they're not in good shape, okay, or two, they have a medical condition or an underlying medical condition that causes them injury or death. They don't realize, oh, I've smoked three and a half packs of cigarettes a day and I drink a case of beer a day. Now I'm going to go try to make an 18 mile hike to save my life. You have to know what you're doing and, and take things slowly and accurately and get there alive. If you overdo yourself and you have a coronary or you overdo yourself and your blood pressure goes sky high and you have a stroke, you've not saved yourself. You've just made yourself harder for everyone else that's with you. So know your limitations and don't overdo it if you want to actually make it to the end. Um, a lot of younger people don't have this problem. Older people start to, and then they think, well, I can do this. I do that to myself all the time. I say, I can do this. My God, I'm 54. I can still do this. And it might be too much for you. So know your limitations. If you need to take a break, stop and take a break. Um, it's not going to, it's not going to get you there any quicker if you have a stroke or a coronary. I promise you. No, absolutely. I 100% agree with you, Al. And I mean, that's... Hey Preppers, do you want 10% off survival food? Go to www.readywise.com and use code DOOM10 at checkout for 10% off all your survival food needs. Again, that's code DOOM10 at checkout at readywise.com, D-O-O-M-10 for 10% off at readywise.com. I've seen this happen a lot over the years, like with people that work and stuff, they overdo it and they, they have, you know, not, I'm not saying like I've seen people have a heart attack, but I've seen people push themselves to injuries at work all the time. I did it a ton when I was younger, right? Let's do more than what I can handle and let's get injured. So guys, here's the one thing I, I do want to make sure we are stressing in this episode, guys, if you are doing this long distance traveling, you know, this, you know, grids down and you're on, on the move, guys. It's not a race. It's about getting there in one piece. It's about getting there alive. It's about getting there safely. It's about, you know, not physically exerting yourself to the point where you can't fight when you get there. Right. Right. You don't want to, you don't want to kill yourself trying to get to your destination. Now, granted, it depends on what the circumstance is. If there's an immediate threat that you're trying to escape from, yes, do what you need to do to survive. But if it's, hey, you know what? Shit's breaking bad. I'm getting out of the city. I got to get to my bug out cabin and I know it's a two day hike. Well, you enjoy that two-day hike. You don't you don't run it. You don't exert yourself. You enjoy that two-day hike. Get there in one piece. Get there with energy to do stuff because you know once you get there, you're going to have work to do. Right? Right. Right. 
avoid con conflict, confrontation, uh, wildlife. Um, these sound like great ideas. Sure, you want to take on the world. Sure, I'm going to ra I'm going I'm to wrestle a bear and then we're going to eat him. All those good things that everybody thinks in their head. But you should avoid contact with other people if you don't want to be seen and you don't want other people in your business or possibly knocking you over the head and taking your items. Two, you want to afflict. You want to to keep from being in conflict with other people or contact with them. Don't go into areas where you go, ooh, it looks like a good place a bear would be. Maybe I should go that way. No, don't go that way. Choose the path that's the wisest path. Um, like Jester just said, you're not doing yourself any favor if you don't make it. If, if you're, if you're overexerting yourself and you're having to fight a bear or having to fend off 12 people that are trying to take all your items, you're, you're not making the best decisions. So look at the situation and figure out, is this a good route for me to take? Do I have a secondary route? Can I avoid being seen this direction? Um, gee, I thought I heard something sound like coyotes over there. Maybe I don't need to go that way. Using your head, not just your feet and your back to make this journey is going to greatly increase your probability of getting there to the end so i mean we talk about all kind of things that people need to have on the trail for everything from a you know a, a flint in order to start a fire or extra set of waterproof matches we talk about all those things all the time and i know people hear that we beat it in their heads and they they understand they need to pack a good pack but we're talking about using the ultimate tool that you have in your prepper uh, cupboard which is your brain and your abilities and the things that you've learned and the things you're going to do to avoid getting hurt, getting injured, getting knocked over the head. So use your brain. That's your number one tool. Oh, absolutely. I could agree more with that. I mean, you know, avoiding conflict and, and avoiding injury is definitely key to get where you, you need to go. Right. Yep. That and I shortcut, mean, that little shortcut that might get your heart leg broke is not doing you any good. You know what I mean? That oh, Exactly. Thing. Now, something else I did want to throw in here as well, guys. Now, when we think survival and we think, you know, traveling on foot, you also think, well, I'm going to have a big knife. I'm going to have a machete. I'm going to have a hatchet. I'm going to have a folding saw. I'm going to have all these things. Yep. I definitely applaud the person that has that mindset. Absolutely. Have all the things you possibly can. Right. But do take a walk with them. Do see how heavy they actually are. Right. Right. The reason is, is because, you know, having that machete, having that folding saw, all these things are phenomenal until you have to start throwing them out of your backpack because you're just like, I need to reduce weight. I need to reduce weight. I can't do this anymore. I got to reduce some weight. Yep. That's, that's key. And that's the thing. People think all these nifty, great ideas, the things that they want. And, they, and it's great to be able to spend the money and do those things. But if you can't haul them with you, that's why I always recommend going the cheaper route, going the the easier route and also going the route of multiple use tools things that you can use for more than one thing um it doesn't do any good if you're trying to hike out of wherever you're at and you're carrying 150 pounds worth of stuff and you weigh like a buck 45 you're probably not going to end up at your location where you're going to and you're not going to end up with everything that you got to if you've got to go up and down hills and you're walking 18 miles you're, you're probably not going to get there with everything so don't expect to um don't set your goals so high that you can obtain them. Absolutely, 100%. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have made that mistake to where they're like, I need to have all of these things. And they start getting to where they're going, and it's like, well, shit, I can't handle carrying all these things. Let me tell you a story, Jester. I used to work on a uh, on the Peace River down in Florida. Uh, and take people out on the river every weekend and drop them up, you know, five miles, eight miles, 15 miles, 25 miles up on the river, and they would, you know, float their way down to the end. You would be astonished at what people start out with and they get a canoe at that. They're not even having to hike all the time. They stop, they camp, they hike a little bit, they get back in the canoe the next day. The things people start out with at the beginning of the trip and the things they end up putting in their car when they leave, I always say, what they get out of their car with, they're going to go home with about a third of what they got out with. You know, they, they can't possibly keep it all. Even in a canoe, they're like, we didn't have enough room. We had to haul it all. We left the cooler. We left the stove. We left this up the river. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's, it, they're grand ideas, but you need to make your ideas and the things that you're going to do reasonable. Um, 
People leave thousands and thousands of dollars worth of supplies behind because they can't take them with them. I've seen it happen. I used to, <laughs> we used to actually would go up the river on jet skis and pick up all the stuff we called all the folks, all the tourists would leave behind. And we had a lot of good camping stuff as kids. So, yeah, don't overdo yourself. No, and, and I mean, back in the day, you know, I was in the Scouts and we used to do a lot of camping. And you'll figure out real quick what's useless to you. And you'll figure out real quick to take things out of their original packaging. Like if it's something that comes in a box, get rid of that box, right? And you're going to find ways to, like when I was a kid, when I, when I would build my little camping kits to go out in the woods with my little survival hiking kits, I always tried to get them in the smallest package possible. And I didn't realize it at the time, but I was a kid. I had a small pack. I didn't have a lot of room. So my idea was to condense this. I had no idea that I was reducing weight at the same time. I always preach this this mentality and think about this with your eyes closed. When they saw my pack in half, I want it to be solid. I don't want there to be any open gaps in there. I mean, if there's a if it's a pair, of, if it's a if it's a bottle that's in there, something needs to be packed inside the bottle. If it's a container, it needs to be totally full. Everything needs to be solid. You need to take up every square inch of what you've got. You know, I see people all the time, they go on these, these walks, these hikes, and they've got an empty cup, and then they got a canteen, they got this, they got that. You're just carrying dead air. You should be carrying something in that dead air. So, uh, that's me. I, every square inch has to get used up. If, it, if you can shove a pack of matches in it, do that. If you can shove this in there, do that. And then look at it and go, gee, that feels heavy. Maybe I should weed something out. You can always weed something out that's taking up space or room that's not actually do anything for you but again going out and taking these things and going on a walk with them you know i have a good friend of mine that comes on my podcast a lot and he does a lot of practical application with the tools and the things that he does he goes out and he tests these things on a weekend on a hike or on a ride or on a canoe trip and then he goes well that right there is useless to me that and he'll tell you the reason why so Actually using these things will teach you this. You can't just depend on waiting for that big day to happen. And you go, oh, let's see how this works out. No, you should have seen before then. You know, something else I'd like to point out about that, too, just in general, you know, the idea of testing your equipment, guys. There's been plenty of things I've bought over the years, and I put it up and said, I'm going to use this one I need, and I go to use it, and it breaks the moment I go to use it, and I find out it's garbage. Right. Right. You know what I just did the other day, Jester? You remember about a year and a half ago, I told you about a cane knife? I told you a cane knife, you'd want a cane knife. It's yeah, light, yeah, I bought it's good. one. <laughs> well, not only did I buy one, but I went and bought myself a brand new one the other day because the one that I had had a lot of wear on it. So I bought myself a new cane knife. That's something I know that's battle-tested that I want to have with me if I'm making a walk. So I bought myself a new one. But I got to break it in this week. So, yeah, you. but you find things that, that you're battle-tested to you, and you go, yeah, that's what I want right there. I wouldn't have known that to pass that on you if I hadn't actually used one in the past. So, yeah, you can learn from other people, and that's something I know that I want on a walk or a journey or a bug out or whatever I, I might be doing. And I'll tell you what, I put that cane knife up somewhere. I couldn't even tell you where that thing's at right now. I know I bought it. I know it's here. I just don't know where. <laughs> Mine actually got shuffled into something and got thrown into a bonfire, and part of the handle got burnt. So I figured, well, while I've got that one I can use around the house, oh, I wow. want a new one to break in to keep just in my bug out bag. So I bought myself a new one the other day. Try a cane knife, folks. You probably don't know what it is. Look it up online. You'll figure it out. I promise you, once you have one, you'll never go with that one again. So... Yeah, I still got to, I got to, I think I put mine, it ended up in one of my doomsday boxes somewhere. So I know it's there, it's within my preps, I just don't know which box it's in. But I mean, you know, I'll tell you what, if when shit does hit the fan, I'm going to have all these boxes to go through and I'm going to have a lot of surprises waiting for me. Yeah, I've got things surprises. That I've forgotten. <laughs> I got a lot of surprises stuck back. Yeah, a lot of things. I've tested them out, but yet they're stuck back just in case. So, But uh, getting your things up that you use and trying them out. whatever it is, You're not going to know how it's used if you don't try it out ahead of time. So make sure your flashlights have batteries in them. Make sure that your matches are waterproof if you think they are. If you think you've got a pack that you're going to have to make a walk or a journey with, have it packed and then take it out and actually use the pack. But don't, I always tell people, don't go out and do these things and set yourself up for the perfect day where you'd never have to bust your pack out. No, don't take any food with you. Use what's in your pack and try and see if those ready-made meals that you've got are actually working 
for you. Try your water purification system and see if it actually works. Go out and see if those shoes are really comfortable, whether or not that cane knife really works for you. That's the only way you're ever going to find out. You don't want to wait until something bad happens and you've got to go out and walk 20 miles to find out that pair of shoes really suck. Um, oh, no, I agree with it 100%. Nice. You, you don't want to do that, folks. You want to set yourself up for, for uh, excellence at best. Now, see, here's the thing, guys. A lot of the conversations Al and I have, we we cover a lot of these things. You know, what to put in the bags, what to put in the vehicles. This is this information is a little bit redundant for people that have listened to the show for a long time. But, guys, this is the thing. you got to get in this mindset of, oh, shit, well, yeah, we've talked about all this stuff, but have I tried this stuff out? Have I thought about what if I have to walk a long distance with this? And this was the whole thing of, you know, the whole point of the show was just to get you into that mindset of what happens when I do got to go? Do I have more in there than what I need? Do I not have enough? Did I forget something? Right. A lot of the things that you're going to have in these bags, you're going to have on your person when you're doing these long distance travels on foot are going to be are going to be area specific things. Right. Right. So, for, for example, I know one area specific thing for me, especially if it's the summer or the spring. I'm going to have a shit ton of bug spray because I know I'm going to need that because mosquitoes get really wicked in my area. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you're, if, say, if you're somewhere that doesn't have mosquitoes, maybe you're doing something a little bit different. Maybe you're kind of preparing uh, things a little bit different than I am. But just get, get into that mindset of what do I need? How is, what do I need to meet my needs? And how can I take everything with me that I need without killing myself in the process of getting where I'm going? Right. And I love the people gesture. Then, and, and and if you're one of these people out there and you're a listener, just listen to me for a minute. I love these people that always say, "Yeah, but you know, Al and Jester, when are you really ever going to have to go walk 20 miles? When are you really going to break down?" It it happens all the time. It happens to people every stinking year. It happens to people in the winter when they get trapped out on the road and they get blizzarded in and they're out there for 24, 36 hours and nobody's coming to save them because there's thousands of other people that are to be saved. It happens when people go out on back roads just going out having a good time in the afternoon or riding around drinking a beer on the back roads and they break down 10 miles away from anybody any civilization nobody's coming out there it happens then it happens when people accidentally get out and they get hiking or camping or boating and they get lost and now they're there overnight trying to figure out how to survive because nobody's coming to get them they didn't tell anybody where they were going this happens every year people think oh it could never happen to me the people that it happens to they thought it couldn't happen to them also but it did so we're trying to make you where your mindset thinks, hmm, I better do this. It's that little second saying, I need to do this that might save your life. Absolutely, guys. And on that note, uh, guys, email us. The email, it's doomsdaypodcast at gmail.com. Drop us a line. Let us know where you're listening from. And for our listeners out there that are on Apple, specifically Apple, if you're listening to us on Apple, I want you guys to do me a favor. Leave a review drop a comment do something because i have no idea how many listeners we have on apple i know that there's a good bit out there but i have i have no idea so if you're listening on apple let us know guys right i'd love to know we like your feedback absolutely and we will catch you guys on next week's episode Emergency action message. At approximately 1 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Nora is tracking 15 ICBM nuclear missiles inbound to the following cities Orlando, Miami, Pittsburgh, Dover, Newark, Richland, Philadelphia, New York City, Baltimore, Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Boston, Seattle, Detroit. This is an extremely deadly situation. Stay tuned, the next emergency message will be a presidential address.